Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany with the Speak Up and Inspire series. And tonight we are going to be talking to our male panel of very, very intelligent, prominent um, men here on the Speak Up and Inspire series. We are having some te technical difficulties. So hold on one second. Take that down. Okay, um, so we are going to be talking to author Shafiq Amin. He is the author of the book, A Message to a Fatherless Generation. This is what we're going to be discussing tonight. We're also going to be talking to author and advocate C. Dwayne Hennett, advocate and promoter, as well as artist J.T. Thompson. We're also going to be talking to branding expert Cedric Sanders, and we have a couple of guests on with us as well. So we are going to um, be talking to everyone about the book Fatherless Generation, but we also want to talk about the impact that having absent fathers in the in children's lives has a lasting effect on children, especially on boys. So I wanna go ahead and introduce our author, Mr. Shafiq Amin. And if you can just give us a synopsis of your book while I am working on some technical things on my end. Absolutely. So a message to a fatherless generation is just that. It is a message that I developed to highlight the, the plight that we have, especially in the African-American community with uh, absent fathers in the lives of their children, uh, specifically their sons, and the devastating impact that their absence has on the life of these children. Um, I wanted to make a plea with the, the message to fathers that it is never too late to reconnect um, with their children um, because children are resilient and they are always looking for the love, the approval, and the guidance of their fathers. Um, I wanted um, these young men and sometimes older men who are not involved in the lives of their children to, to realize that um, it is not or shouldn't be up to the state, to um, community activists, to support groups, to mentors, to take on the role of the father when the father is an able-bodied individual who is more than capable of taking on that role himself. Um, but it's not to criticize absent fathers, but to give them a hand and say that your children need you, that society needs you, and um, we just need to encourage them that um, we can make a bad situation better if we decide that um, it is important enough to, to be in our children's lives so they can become productive citizens and productive members of society. Thank you so much for that. So um, tell us what your background is personally and professionally. Uh, so I am a, a educator. Um, I've been a elementary, middle, and high school teacher for the past 25 years. I'm currently uh, an adjunct professor at Norfolk State University, and I've taught there for the past 12 years. Um, I am an advocate for um, educational equality in the United States and a, um, a strong proponent of making sure that um, we provide um, young men and young women all of the accesses that they possibly need in order to be successful. Thank you so much. So when you wrote a message to a fatherless generation, what was the feedback that you received from people when you decided to write this book? Uh, the majority of it was uh, really positive, especially from, um, from the men. Um, I, I tried to lay out um, statistical data on what happens when fathers are absent in the lives of especially their sons, um, the increase in incarceration, 
um, the increase in student dropout um, behavioral problems at school, um, a, a lack of respect for women and um, females in authority, um, overly emotional young men who are just starving to, to be men, but they don't have that model in order to lead their lives, and um, an increase in teen pregnancy, that all of that stems from fathers not being in the lives of their children. Uh, so those are uh, some of the responses that I've got. I've gotten some negative feedback from some, some mothers who thought that um, I was letting fathers off the hook uh, and not holding them responsible. And I can understand that because um, the mothers have been doing yeoman work, um, being mothers and fathers and doing everything possible for these young men. And um, I didn't want to be overly critical of the men because I want them back in the lives of their children. So that's where I, I got a little feedback from that, little negative feedback. Understood, understood. Um, who do we have with us today? I see that you have invited some guests with us today. Can you introduce them to us? Oh, absolutely. I have my, my lovely wife, uh, Kalima Amin, and uh, she um, helped edit the book for me and gave me some um, constructive uh, criticism and feedback. And I have my uh, sister-in-law, uh, Crystal Salam, and uh, she has always been a, uh, a staunch advocate for, for children. And she's also an educator, an excellent educator in her own right. So they're, they're both here uh, to uh, give me a moral support. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I'm looking at your website, which is Shafiq Amin, S-H-A-F-E-E-Q-A-M-E-E-N.com for those who are not sure the spelling. And I am reading about what your caption for a message to a father's generation, the devastating consequences of absent fathers in the lives of boys. So I'm going to ask a personal question. Was this your experience growing up, not having your father present? No, I mean I was uh, I was fortunate. My uh, my my parents were were married um, up until um, I was 17 years old. So my my formative years I spent with my father. Uh, the reason that I wrote the book is because um, as a an educator, um, I would see so many young men in my classroom, and I could see that. Uh, they were starving for attention, um, that they gravitated towards me or any male that was in the building. And um, they were, for the most part, pretty disrespectful to the female teachers, even the female administrators. And I would sit down and have conversations with them. And I could see that even though their frustration and their pain was directed towards females, um, the majority of the angst that they had came from not having their fathers in their lives and they had to lash out at something or someone and it tended to be uh, females as opposed to males. Very good, very good. Um, th thank you for sharing that um, personal experience. I think it's really important that when we're talking to authors, especially about something as deep as your book, A Father's Generation, that we know what the author's background is. Um, I know when people say, you should read this book, and it's a maybe a marriage book. And I'm like, okay, is the author even married? <laughs> so I like to know who it is that is writing the books that I'm reading, especially when they're um, this type of book, because I want to know the expertise behind what it is that I'm reading. And I know that you have over 30 years in the classroom working with young men and, and boys. Um, and so that definitely gives you experience and that actually, actually gives you the expertise, but also growing up with the father in your family, I'm sure it was able to give you a lot of insight as well. It was, and I, I had a, uh, um, my father was pretty, he was pretty demanding. And so he, um, he was, no nonsense. So he made sure that that we towed the line. 
in, in many cases, he wasn't the, the greatest of examples until later in his life, but um, he, he put a lot of pressure on me and my brother to be uh, the best men that we could be, not to make excuses, to work hard, um, to be the leaders in the household. And uh, hopefully these are traits that I continue to carry on now. And it's, it's what I tell um, boys and um, young fathers when it comes to, to raising sons that, you know, you can be the best role model possible, but in many cases we're imperfect role models. But the kids and the children, they, they appreciate our effort our guidance, and most importantly, the time that we put into trying to make them the best human beings possible. Very nice. Thank you for sharing that. Are you a father yourself? I am. I have a. I have three, three daughters and a, and a stepson, and um, it is uh, one of the the greatest blessings in my life is to to be a parent. Um, I love the responsibility of. Um, taking uh, a human being and actually molding them into what you want to make up of them and put in your uh, the input of uh, being the best individuals they can be. And um, I take it seriously that, you know, the successes that, that my children have, that um, I've either directly or indirectly played a role in that. And then any the any of the negatives that um, comes with them being raised, I, I play a significant role in that too. So um, I, I understand the importance of being a good father, the importance of being a role model, uh, more than just telling children what to do. You know, living the example of being the best person that you can be, and uh, our kids tend to pick that up. Our kids. They find that if, if you look in the mirror, then you can see your child in you, uh, the good and the bad, if we're honest with ourselves. And I see that quite often. Right, right. And that is true. I'm a mom. Um, I have 13-year-old twins. And every day I look at them and I can see a part of me in them. Absolutely. But I can also see them growing up as individuals as well. Right. And um, it, definitely, it, it definitely is an honor. And it's, it's a very hard job to be a parent. Um, there's no, yeah, there's no book. There's no book out there that says this is what you do from birth till, you know, till they're 18, 21 years old. There's no, there's no script out there. <laughs> Tiffany, my next book is hopefully I'll have it out by this summer. And uh -huh. it's, going be, it's going to be called Parenthood 101, the blueprint for being a successful parent. Oh, I love it. I love it. Okay. Well, we're going to have to get you back on and talk about that one now. <laughs> yes, I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, well, I hope I don't hope you don't mind me um, asking your wife a question. Oh, no, not at all. Miss <laughs> um, Amin, with you um, being on this journey with your husband and um, him spreading this message about a fatherless generation. How has that been for you as his partner um, in raising your, your children? Well, it's definitely been a journey and um, a positive journey, of course. He's been very influential in the life of my son. And um, since he has all daughters and I only have a son, we get to have sons and daughters vicariously through each other. So now I have three um, daughters that would not have had otherwise. So it's been a great journey. And um, I've learned a lot, actually, um, being a divorced single parent, when we met, um, I was doing pretty much, you know, everything right in the eyes of a mom, mm -hmm. but not seeing it from the eyes of a dad. Right. And so it just gave me a 360 view. And he can't, we came together at a great time in my son's life, because now he's He's approaching being a teenager. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's good to always, you know, have Shafiq there. And I, you know, he'll say, you should do X, Y, Z. And I'm just doing what a mom does. You know, nothing wrong, nothing bad. But we only see one side because we're moms, you right. know. And so he, he actually has allowed me to be able to free up my son and let him explore things without trying to mother him and, 
you know, protect him. And he'll say, oh, he's thir- almost 13. He can do this and he can do that. Let him go. So right. it's been, you know, a learning experience for me as well. Right. Yes. I um, can speak on that myself. I was a single parent for about eight years before I married my husband mm-hmm. who was beside me. And I have, I have a son and I have a daughter. They're twins. So um, raising my daughter was like, okay, yes, I've got this. But then with yes. my son, I was just like, even though his father was very active in his life, he lived with me all this mm-hmm. time. Right. So it was just like, even when it came to potty training, I <laughs> <laughs> funny story, funny, yes. very funny story. I sat my son down and told him to put it down so that he could go to the bathroom because I didn't know how to teach him how to stand up and go to the bathroom. Right. Um, so something as what should be simple um, up to, you know, him starting puberty, I really had to talk to his, his father about a lot of things because, of course, I'm not a man. I can't teach him certain things. Exactly. So, and so I do duck out of things and say, yeah, you, know what? Yeah. you take care of that because I just kind of duck out now, you know, it's good, <laughs> you know, it's a good thing. <laughs> yes, it is. And then when my husband came along, he was able to help me with, with certain things right. um, because again, he's a man and it, he can give him that perspective from a man's point of view. I was bringing him up as the type of man that I would want him to be without being a man. So um, I definitely mm-hmm. appreciate your feedback on that because I can relate to that. Definitely. Yes. <laughs> uh, I wanted a funny story for you. Just a quick one. So mm-hmm. when you were talking about the potty training, yes. So when I was, um, um, I, I used to teach high school English, um, but before that, I was in. A, I used to be an elementary school. I used to be a third grade teacher, and um, the principal called a mother into the office. Um, said, you know, I have to tell you something about your son, and he was he stayed in trouble a lot. And she said, well, what did he do this time? He said, no, no, it's nothing bad. She said, would you mind if we give you some some male advice? And she said, sure. And she said, well, uh, we just noticed that uh, every time your son goes to the bathroom, he sits down. Can we help help him stand up? Would that be okay? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, when, when my son went to his dad's house and he was sitting down, my, his dad immediately called me and said, what are you teaching my son? Mm-hmm. And I said, I'm teaching him what I know for him to do. <laughs> so yes, that's funny. Thank you for sharing, <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to go ahead and um, introduce the rest of our panelists tonight. Um, and I'll start with my... My other half here, Mr. Cedric Sanders, he's a um, marketing guru, brand ambassador. Uh, He does um, logos, he does graphic design, he does everything. So whenever you see anything that has to do with graphics or flyers or banners or anything, it's coming from him coming from him. So um, just wanted to go ahead and let him introduce himself. And I know that he had a comment to piggyback off what we were just talking about. Absolutely. Um, let me, I want to get my, my comment off before I forget. Mm-hmm. I apologize, y'all. But um, I felt like that was the, the perfect opening for what we're doing here. Because again, you know, yes, this is a, a men's panel and, you know, we're talking about, you know, fathers. Um, so uh, your wife had a great comment that I feel like we should a little more emphasis on and it was about the fact that she was doing what she knew best to do as a mom but she had to do the 360 to see it from your perspective on the father side of it so this goes back to what you were saying about the negative um i guess the negative comments about your book um it's not a it's not shade towards the women towards the mothers towards the single mothers it's not that you know it's just specifically about the fathers and their relationships with their kids especially with their sons so it's it's not saying that a, a mom can't do it or, or you know it's not saying anything like that but it's these boys need their dad you know what i mean it, there's just there's just and, and I came up like that. I came up in a single parent home. You know, my, my parents divorced when I was three. So my mom did everything she could 
and I appreciate it. But even now, as a 35 year old man, I know that there's things that I'm missing because I did not have my father. So I just want to, like I said, reiterate the fact that, and I appreciate you know, people like, you know, your wife and stuff like that, you know, I just want to make sure that, you know, for all the viewers, this is nothing against those single moms that, you know, work two, three jobs and, and, and grind it all night and day to take care of their kids and raise them the best way they can. It's, it's no, nothing against them. This is just about the fathers. So I just, I, I wanted to make sure that, that we, we started there because I can see the, the women viewers jumping on and, oh, you know, what if, no. So it's not that. So I want to make sure that we we got a good foundation before we go. Um, so, but yes, I'm a, I'm a freelance graphic designer. to so do logos, business cards, uh, uh, flyers, uh, banners, stuff like that. I do all of the design work for the uh, Speak Up and Inspire, for my wife, for her books and all her adventures that she has. And um, I also work, um in corporate printing uh for a food line corporate office um so but yeah that's you know thank you thank you um mr Dwayne, introduce yourself please <laughs> i am c Dwayne hennett um author of the ripple effect the lasting effects of domestic violence i am an author activist and professional speaker um I do advocate for uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, homelessness, and uh, mental uh, mental illness because I believe that these are linked. Um, so um, you may see me on my page, you know, talk about domestic violence. You may see me talk about sexual assault. You may see me talk about human trafficking as well. Very nice. Um, tell us real briefly about your book because I think it's it's relevant. Oh, yeah, it is relevant um, because there actually is a section in my book where I do talk about, you know, the absentee, you know, uh, absentee of a father. Um, it is uh, the ripple effect, the lasting effects of domestic violence. And it's a book um, about domestic violence. It goes through the ups and downs, the highs and lows. Um, it gives very detailed. It's told from the point of view of a novice uh, because when I learned about domestic violence, I was a novice. I had no experience in it. Um, I came from a two-parent family home, didn't see any domestic violence, had uh, three sisters who were married, well, two sisters, had three sisters, two of them, which I met, who were married, didn't see any domestic violence in their relationship. So I didn't have any, you know, experience in it. Um, but once I started working in the field of domestic violence, I started seeing patterns and I started seeing, you know, things going on in, you know, my friends and, you know, co-workers um, relationships where I saw that could have been, there were issues. Um, like I said, in, in my book, I talk about how, you know, an uh, absent father affects domestic violence, how it could, you know, how it could lead to other things um, as far as uh, domestic violence and being, you know, how domestic violence is looked at, you know, in a home. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, we've had you on our podcast before. Um, we've also done a panel on your book as well. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that brief introduction. Um, JT, are you there? Can I, can I say something real quick? Yes. About, I just want to chime in on what, you know, Cedric said. I just want to piggyback off of what he said. Um, you know, when we talk about, you know, single moms and we talk about, you know, fathers being active and, you know, what we're looking for or what, what it should be is that it should be a balance. It should be a balance of, you know, fathers being involved and mothers, you know, single mothers being involved as well. Because you want, you know, your child, be it female or male, to have a good balance of, a, of an active father and an active mother. Because if you don't, especially, you know, when it comes to the, the male perspective of it, we're missing something. And then if we're missing something, you know, if, you know, your pendulum swings to a certain part of a way where you have these monsters out here roaming the streets that have no accountability. So when we talk about, you know, it's, it's never a fact that we're, we're speaking out against single mothers. We're speaking out that children need a balance a good balance of both. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, I know that I could not have done it alone. Um, I mean, I'm sure I could have done it alone, but I did not want to do it alone. And so even though I was a single mom and their father was active in their life, I still had a village 
of strong men that were around me and my kids so that my kids still had that those positive male role models um, while I was single and, and even now those um, men that were in my life as role models are still in my life and still in, have met my husband are still in all of our lives now. So um, I definitely appreciate you bringing that because it's really important. A lot of times single moms might have something against dad and it's really the mom who's keeping the children away from the father. Um, so I think that women also need to understand that regardless of your relationship with that man, unless he's abusive to your children or he's not good for your children, that you shouldn't keep your children away from their father because of your, your personal feelings towards them, unless they're harmful to your children. I think that's really important for, for single moms and mothers to understand and to, and to really think about because it can, it can, it can affect your children and in the end, their relationship with you is gonna be affected as well if you keep them away from their, their fathers for a reason that is not the right reason. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, Mr. JT uh, Thompson, please introduce yourself, young man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it's great to be on this panel. It's an honor. Um, a lot of great things have already been shared. Um, I'll just say, um, I do a lot of things. I call it jack of all trades. Um, but the most important roles that I play in, in my life is uh, husband and father. And I'll say what we're touching on tonight is impact and inspiration for our youth. It's very important that, that we as men, we as fathers, continue to be strong and in, in, in be in leadership and not, you know, in the role of following anything. We are leaders and, and, we, and we're strong to have an impact on this life and we got to keep doing things like this in order to highlight and enlighten the things that we have going on. Yes. Thank you, Mr. JT. I appreciate that. Um, so we're going to jump right in because I really want to make sure that we um, cover your book um, the best that we can. Um, Ms. Crystal, before we move on, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I'm uh, Crystal Overton Salam, uh, sister to um, Kalima and uh, sister-in-law to um, Dr. Shafiq. And I'm just, just here to support um, um, Dr. Shafiq. And um, we have his books in our house and we try to spread them, you know, by my husband purchases them and we try to give them to young men, um, especially his last one, The Fabulous Generation. So We've just been spreading the book um, in our community and um, in our family to make sure the young men um, can uh, get this must read. So important for um, families to support each other, especially when it's something this um, serious and something as serious as this topic. So definitely appreciate you for supporting um, your brother-in-law and um, also sharing it with other young men or other young fathers. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. So Mr. Shafiq, yes, tell us with the fatherless generation, I saw in your books, does everybody have their book? Um, Dwayne and uh, JT, do y'all have your books in front of you? Yes, okay. So what I wanted Cedric to, what I wanted you all to do was to share the quotes that Shafiq put in the inset. So Cedric, can you share what he wrote in yours? Yeah. <laughs> A father should be the man he wants his child to become. He should not force his child to be the man he never was. So let's address that, Mr. Sheffy. Can can give us some insight on the reason why you wrote that? Um, well, I think it's 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 impactful that fathers um, always look at themselves as being role models. Um, as I said before, we're imperfect role models, um, but there there's no training manual to be a great dad. But if there was one, um, I think one of the number one uh, components of that is a good father um, listens and spends time with his child. And when you spend time with your child, they are going to um, 
emulate some of the things that you're doing. They're going to imitate them. And so you have to be, be mindful. I know with my, my stepson um, that, you know, with my daughters that um, I'm, I was the, the, the apple of their eyes. I mean, I, I could do no wrong. And um, they would, when they would give their mother grief, they would run to me. And um, I mean, I was always their support system and I never had to discipline them at all in their entire lives. And then, you know, as that went on, I started to remember being in the classroom with boys and um, I knew a lot about boys, but, but being a stepfather, you start to see firsthand that it's, it's not about what you say, it's about what you do. And sometime I'll, I'll be doing something and then I'll turn around, I'll see my stepson and he's looking at me, you know, he's just, you know, trying to check out why did I say that? Why am I looking that way? Why, um, you know, why am I dressed that way? How do I interact with uh, people in the public? And I never realized the responsibility of, of, you know, just actually being the person that I would want him to be. So uh, that, I thought that quote was uh, apropos. It was, uh, it was important because we always have to to be mindful of the things that we do and the things that we say, because um, our children are watching. And then with boys, you know, they they may not tell you, but you're the man that they aspire to be. And so you you have to take that responsibility seriously. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so I had a comment to that. Um, and this was, of course, you know, I ain't say it now, but. I kind of wanted to put this to Tiffany later on. I would love to do a part two to this and kind of zone in on the life and the struggles of being a step parent because that's a whole nother realm, especially to y'all that 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 know that right. what, what that's like. You know, it's that's it's like you know when single parents that's like a whole nother realm or like step parents like it's a whole nother realm and i've learned so much over the years when it comes to that like you know with being with tiffany and she's already had kids so there was the struggle of what do i call him and then um you know for me i just i treat them like i would treat my own so you know with, you know to a lot of my friends and, and family stuff like that you know, yeah, my son, my daughter, you know, and it's just, it just comes natural to me, you know, so, and, and we don't, apparently don't use the term step in our house, whatever, and, and they hit me to that a long time ago, so it was like, no, like, you're a bonus dad, but we don't use the term step, so, um, but to go into what you were saying, um, being in uh, my son Devin's life, um, especially for the last four or five years. Um, he has a father, right? His father is, is active in his life. He talks to his father on a regular basis. But living here and me being here with his mom, you know, there's a different struggles that I had to go through because he knows he has a dad. So I have to kind of remind him that I'm not trying to be your, your dad. But, you know, we kind of on the same page. It's like a village, you know. And so I want to make sure that we're, we're doing this together to raise him to be the man that he needs to be. And so just, and, and that was real strong, the, the quote in the book, because, like, there's, there's so much difference in when I was 13 compared to when, you know, Devin being 13 now. So, like... I could never walk out the house with skinny jeans, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, my son, that's, that's his thing. Now he liked that. That's, that's his style. And so I, me as, as stepdad, I have to understand bonus dad. Sorry. <laughs> I have to understand that that's, that's him. You know, right. he, he's, it's, it's not, it's going back to that when you're molding the kids, you know, he's not three, four, five, you know, anymore. He's 13. He's a teenager. So he is kind of coming into his own. So, you know, might maybe how he wants to, you know, do his hair or, you know, or, or things like that. So just trying to understand that, but at the same time, give him the, the foundation and the tools. So um, he notices now when we all go out to eat, 
So, you know, it's, it's split. You know, there's two boys, there's two girls. When we go out to eat, and it's just always been my thing, I sit where I can see the front door. You know, and, and it took a while for the kids to pick up on that because in their eyes it was, I want to sit beside mommy. No, I want to sit beside mommy or whatever. And so in my eyes, it's, I would love to sit beside my wife. You know what I mean? But it's just in me to be in that spot where I can see the door. Something jump off, something pop off. It's my job to take care of my family. And so in the last year, my son, he started to pick up on that. And so now he does it too. Okay. You know, so it's just, you know, they they see it in us. And, and even though we might not see it in them every day, you know, they are picking up on this sponge. They, they are sponges. Mm -hmm. So um, it was definitely, I appreciate the, the quote. No, they, those were, those were great points. I, I think before, before I, I submitted the book for publication, I should have solicited your advice because you, uh, you just <laughs> threw out some jewels in there that I definitely could have put in the book. Um, <laughs> well, I think we, we definitely need a show about um, being a step parent because it's, uh, it's different. And it's, uh, I think uh, we would definitely have an audience for it. Yes, yes definitely, definitely. So she's going she gonna to put that on the book. Yeah, I'm, I'm already thinking about it. I'm already thinking about it. She's making notes. She's making notes. <laughs> it's going to be in the book. Uh, Mr. Dwayne, did you have a quote in your book? I did. Okay, can um, you read yours? Sure. There is, no, uh, there is no love on earth greater than that of a father for his son. So uh, when I read that, I struggled. Uh, I struggled with the concept of it only because I had uh, I had so much. Um, let me see. How can I say it? Um, influence from the women in my life. I, like I said, I grew up with you know my mother. My mother, and my parents were married, and then I have three sisters. So my three sisters were like three different mothers. <laughs> So it was like, you know, you know, the disappointment part, I couldn't disappoint my mother, I couldn't disappoint my older sister, couldn't disappoint my second older sister, couldn't disappoint my third older sister. So I had a lot of influence from, you know, the females that were in my life. Not to say that my father wasn't the influence in my life. Um, he was, but the overwhelming influence came from them. And once I read, once I read that quote, once I started doing research on my book and how, you know, um, the lack of a father, the lack of a, of a, of a male influence can affect you. Then I started looking back over, you know, over, over just different parts of my life and saying, you know, my dad was this, he come from a different era. Um, he wasn't a very affectionate person. Um, he, he was a, he, he had a third grade education. Um, but he, he had his, he was an entrepreneur. Um, and he worked really hard. Uh, so he was the second oldest male and a family of uh, nine. Uh, so once his parents died early, he took up on the responsibility of his other, other siblings, raising his other si siblings and stuff like that. So he had a hard life. So a lot of, uh, uh, of emotions that he didn't have a father in his life, he didn't know how to do. So he didn't know how to show emotion because his father, you know, passed when he was young, when he was young. So he didn't know how to transition as far as passing along information or passing along, you know, only thing that he, only thing that he knew what to be in the rut was being a provider, being a husband, and to be a, a, a disciplinary. Because that's what he had, to, that's what he had to do in his own home, because he was the oldest male. And and so it was like, you know, I got to take on the man because he, he quit school because, you know, he had to go work. I mean, he had hard work. Um, and then I look at, you know, you know, the relationships that I have with my two sons. I have um, two boys. Um, I have a 22-year-old uh, 20, that's going to turn 22 this, this Monday. Um, and then I have a five-year-old. Um, 
<laughs> a five-year-old. Uh, Sound like us over here, Dwayne. Yeah, it's it's different because they're gonna they're they're gonna be raised by two different. Believe it or not, they're just, even though I'm the same man, it's just two different fathers. I was a different father when I was at 21 than I am at 44. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of things that I that I learned um, now I had to experience um, in my 20s. It was a it was a filling out process. Mm -hmm. So my younger one is going to benefit more because he has a more experienced father mm -hmm. than my 21 year old, uh, than my 22 year old that I have now. And I, I think back, you know, what kind of influence I could have, you know, I can have with my, my two boys, my two boys that I have now. And it's, 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 you think about what kind of influence that you, if you were absent. Right. Like, like I like I, I tell people now, like my life could have changed a different way if I wouldn't have had a father figure in my life because I know how to be I know how to be a provider. I know how to be accountable. Those are two those are two things that I think that that should be in men anyway. Especially if you have children. You have to be a provider and you have to be accountable. Because to have accountability, you have to also show accountability. Very important. Very, very important. Mr. JT, do you have your book in front of you to be able to share your quote? Don't have my book in front of me, but I do have something uh, I want to ask. Um, the okay. role of the role of a father when it pertains to a son has always been stressed, but it seems like within the last two to three years, the role of a father in the daughter's life, great emphasis has been put on that because you were setting the stage for what your daughter would be looking for. And so what is your take as far as the, the, the highlight of a girl dad and how important the role of the father in the daughter's life is? That's but, a good question. I, I, the studies that, that um, I have been able to, to gather on parents and their children, um, one thing that we the studies tell us is that the, the greatest influence on a child tends to be the same sex parent. So the, the fathers tend to be the greatest influencers of their sons, where the mothers tend to be the greatest influencers of their daughters. But um, I, looking at your point and me being in public education, that I have seen the devastating impacts of girls who have absent fathers in their lives. They, they definitely have that um, a, a, a daddy crisis. And you can, you can tell, you know, all they need to do is have some boy tell them they look cute and they always wanted that from their dad or give them attention that they really wish they had from that that male role model in their life. Now I'm generalizing, it's not always like that, but you can see that you know, fathers play a tremendous role in the lives of girls. You know, I was, my, um, my middle daughter, um, I was so proud of her. And I, I never really told her this either, but when she went off to college, um, she, she gave me a call once and she said, uh, she said, dad, I want you, uh, I want you to come up to the school and she, you know, never got in any trouble. So I wasn't, you know, afraid she was going to get put out or something of that nature, but it, it just seemed unusual. I said, sure. So I came up to the school and uh, I was in, I was in Virginia and I drove up to Atlanta to see her. And she said, I wanted you to come up here because um, I have a boyfriend and I wanted you to meet him and I want to get your approval you know, before this goes any further. And oh. I mean, I was so touched by that. And then she said, uh, I, I picked him because he reminds me of you. And I like, oh my God, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna start crying. I can't let her see, I'm just bawling. But it was, uh, you know, just the, the importance of knowing that your, your daughters, you know, respect you as a man. And that when they look at their, their mates, that they're, they're looking at them having the type of qualities that you have. So it's, it's really important. 
That's a very good point. And um, I've noticed that um, I've been a social worker for about 10 years now, and I too can see the impact of um, an absent father or a fatherless family when mm. it comes to um, boys and girls. And it affects both in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen it in girls as well. And the same thing, um, either being um, starting off being promiscuous at early ages, um, wanting the attention from any boy and even men, um, uh, you know, having a having low self esteem, um, looking for love in the wrong places, as they say, um, you know, and just really having trying to figure out who she is as a young lady, and then the choices that she makes in her boyfriends or her husband because she didn't have a good role model or a good male role model in her life to be able to teach her what a man is supposed to be like and how he's supposed to treat his wife or how he's supposed to treat his girlfriend and so forth. So that was a very good question, JT. And that's one I want to circle back to later to talk about the girls. Um, very briefly, we have Jonathan. Can you introduce yourself well, um, briefly? And we're, then we're going to continue to move on. I just want to make sure that everybody knows who you are, Jonathan. Oh, I finally got this thing on. Sorry about that. <laughs> So just introduce yourself real quick, real quick, and because we we have started a, a conversation now. Tell them to you're, unmute. You're on, yeah, you're on mute. <laughs> it's okay, Jonathan. It's okay. We'll we'll bring you in. So as soon as I see you um, unmute yourself, then I'll include you to, to introduce yourself. Okay, so I think that this is a really good place to talk about um, the chapter on my role model. So Shafi, can you tell us about that chapter um, specifically? And then I want to talk to the other men on the panel about role models in, in their lives. Absolutely. So um, I wanted to make sure that um, I highlighted a section on the importance of fathers being uh, role models um, because um, our children are going to look at us and look up to us in the things that we do. So uh, being a role model, um, I think it's, it's, it's so important because it, it puts an added pressure on the father, but it should be a pressure that you want because it should be a pressure that keeps you straight, that puts you on a straight and narrow to say, when, when my children say something about me as their father, then they know that I did everything I could to be the best example I possibly could be for them. When you take on that responsibility, and that's, that's the role of being a parent, but especially when it's the same sex parent to that child, they look at you, and I tell you, there is there is nothing worse than being a father, and you look at your son, and all of the negative things you've done in your life, you see him doing the exact same thing. You mm -hmm. feel like a complete failure, and, mm -hmm. you know, that's under our control. Right. Right. Um, I can understand that. That was, that was pretty strong. Um, when I, when I talk, to, when I see my daughter, um, I see a lot of myself in her. And when she makes mistakes, I look at myself and say, okay, I've made those mistakes too. Right. So I definitely can understand that and how that can affect you. Because then you look at yourself like, you know, what did I do wrong? Why did I do this this way? So forth and so on. And I'm very transparent with my kids. And I will tell them in a minute, if I make a mistake, I've told them probably in 13 years, I've probably told them at least 13 times, mommy made a mistake. And this is what happened. And I try to explain to them why it was a mistake so that they can learn accountability too. Because as their mother, I have to be accountable for what I do because it affects them. So um, that was a good point. I, I know sometimes uh, my daughters, uh, they're older. And uh, to, I guess to, I want to take it as a joke, but I don't know if it's a joke or not. When I catch them doing something that I know is wrong, I'll say, I don't know why you're doing that. Why'd you do that? And they, they're like, Dad, I'm just like you. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, how about you, Cedric? Um, 
can you share your your input on being a role model because I'm not sure if everybody knows it's on the panel, but we're about to be parents again. We have a daughter on the way in May. And so he's about to be a first time dad. So um, before I let him answer that, Shafiq, what are the kind of um, advice that you give to men who are going to be new fathers? What are some things that you can share with, um, um, with anyone, any, any male that's about to become a father? Um take this take this role on as the most important thing you've ever done in your life but you take it on with um a sense of pride and dedication you know once you realize that that you are going to be a parent and that child is your seed that's a part of you you know always realize that that child um is a part of your soul. It's a part of your DNA now. So you want to make sure that you put that child in the best position possible to be successful. That's making sure you instruct them with the proper morals, the proper values, the proper respect of their mother, the proper respect of you and society. And all of that may seem like a heavy burden, but when you take it on as a, you know, as a, as a mantle, as a, as a, as a crown that you would be surprised it it would just it will bring a smile to your face to know that you know you're doing the very best you can and I'm telling you once you see your child being born and you look at that child and you see that 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 is you that's a part of you there's no greater feeling in the world um so I guess my question is as as Cedric's wife and knowing that he for the most part, grew up without his father being um, active in his life. You, we don't want to repeat that cycle. So how do you tell a young man who is about to have a child about, you know, fatherhood and, you know, the suggestions that you just gave who didn't have his father in his life? So sometimes the, the, the best teachers are mistakes. So what you do is that um, you learn from the mistakes of others you know we we don't pick our parents you know they they pick us or god picks them for us so what you do is that you you try to pull whatever positive you can but if there were negatives then you want to make sure you don't want to be that person that says well the reason i'm doing this is because that's the way i was raised that's an excuse what you say is that these are things that were done wrong. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure I don't repeat that pattern. And you can do it. I mean, it's not, you know, it, it, it's harder for people who didn't have that role model, but it is not impossible. And um, I have confidence in you. I have confidence in you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, man, uh, y'all forgive me. This this is a, a sensitive topic for myself so and it just so happened that your book came at probably the greatest time in my life okay. um just based off of what i'm going through so um you know to, to get personal so i didn't grow up with my father um my parents divorced when i was three and it took me i didn't realize the effect that it had on me, honestly, until I got married. Mm. Um, you know, I made a lot of mistakes and really couldn't figure out where the mistakes were coming from. Um, and so uh, a big decision that I made in my life um, a couple of years ago was to go seek therapy. Um, and Growing up, that was that was like a no no for for men. Like nah, like you know, my pride. I'm a I'm a man. I don't need nobody to talk to me, tell me what I. You know what I mean? Like I grew up with that, and this is based off of what I was seeing because my dad wasn't there. You know, and you know, I I my mom is is my biggest role model, and I appreciate her. But even she knows that there was things that she couldn't do 
as my mom because she can't be my dad. So, you know, once I got into therapy and I really started talking to my therapist about the things that I've done, um, decisions and stuff that I've made, I mean, he was really frank with me and he was like, a lot of what you got going on is because of the lack of relationship you have with your father uh, and, and is it comes down to the parents right. and that was hard to hear because I felt like my mom was there for me like my whole life you know what I mean and, and she did everything she could and you know but he was very very transparent and you know his mistakes on her end too you know right. and um there's decisions and choices on her end and, and too so um and I still have a lot of I'm still kind of going through it with the whole lack of relationship with my dad. I uh, call myself trying to forgive him for not being there, but I haven't moved past it. I still feel like there's a hole in my heart. Mm -hmm. And that hole is, is that, that I didn't have that, that father that everybody else has. And so when I, you know, in talking to my therapist, he was kind of breaking down that, that hole, that, that, what I feel like I'm missing, he said, going into this new journey of being a, a new father to my own child, a girl dad at that, he said, you don't have to be your father. You be your own father. You learn from the lack thereof. You learn from the mistakes, what he didn't do, and you make sure that you do it better. Um, and so I made a post last week when I find, you know, I hadn't, it's been tough trying to get with my therapist. So I finally got with him again. And when I finished, it was like when you take a shower and you get out and your pores is all open. I literally was in the car crying for 45 minutes. And I was like, I just want to be able to give my daughter the very best version of me. I don't, I don't want to give her Milton Sr., which is my dad. I don't want to give her that. I want to give her Cedric, the, the very best Cedric that she could possibly have. And um, and so, like I said, the book just came, it just came in at the perfect time for me because I'm going through this right now. And I've just kind of made it my mission to, to figure out this, this thing with my dad. And, and, and it's just, it's, I need to figure it out because the baby's going to be here in like six, seven weeks. And I feel like for me to be that best version of myself, I need to have that sit down conversation with him, tell him how I feel about him not being in my life, how it's affected me as a man, and just kind of hear what he has to say. And, and it's, it's tough because I want him to be this, this father that I want, right. but it's not a guarantee that he's going to be that father that I want. And I'm having a hard time with that like my expectations. I got it. Well, if I can, just a few things. First, uh, that hole that you have in your heart is real. And it's something that um, a lot of young men and older men go through. But the only way that you can start to, to heal that hole that you have in, in your heart, regardless of what your father says, when you have that conversation with him, you're going to have to forgive them. You're going to have to, and and you can't and you can't look at um, him not being the father that you wanted him to be. He is who he is, and he did what he did. And you you just you have to purge yourself. You just have to say, listen, I'm going to say my piece. I'm going to have to find a way to listen to what he has to say. It may hurt. It may be helpful, but at the end of the day. The only way I can have any healing whatsoever and to be the best father that I can be is that I have to get forgiveness. And that forgiveness comes from you, not from him. You have to forgive yourself for feeling the way that you feel. You can't make him be a better person. You can only be responsible for yourself. And when you think about you're going to be a father and you don't want to bring this baggage into fatherhood. You, you don't want to have your child, you don't want your child to have to pay 
for what you went through. You want to be the best person you can be, yet, but this is not going to be perfect. And it's not something that is going to, your heart is not going to heal overnight. But whenever you get to the point where either with your therapist or just with yourself to say, you know what, whatever my father says, I'm going to forgive him. And I'm forgiving him, not for him. I'm forgiving him for myself because I can't move forward if I keep on feeling in my heart he could have been a better person. He could have been a better father. I wish he would have did this. I wish he, because that's not going to happen. That's water under the bridge. You have to say, you know what? Maybe this is my chance in being a, a parent of being a better example of my father to my children. You know? Thank you. That's um, really important um, as, you know, as Cedric's wife to, to recognize that he has that, that, that void. And I've, um, I'm trying to support him, you know, the best I can with that. But this is another reason why I wanted to explore your book and wanted him to be a part of the panel so that he can talk to other men who are fathers and other men who might have had that void in their lives as well. But also just to give him some insight because now he's about to be a new dad. So mm -hmm. um, I really appreciate that feedback. And um I think that that was one of the strongest chapters that I read in your book personally for me um, was to read that part about, you know, a role model and the importance of it. And, you know, you sharing your story about your father and, you know, how he raised you. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a very, very, very deep chapter, very deep chapter. Um, Mr. Dwayne, um, your comments, I, I've seen you smiling and nodding. What's your take on being a role model or can you speak on maybe who your role model was growing up? Um, sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna say this, uh, a little bit of advice to say, uh, congratulations, number one, uh, on your first kid. Um, number two is that um, being a first time father of a daughter. Thank you. It's gonna change your world. <laughs> it's gonna change your life because every male looks suspect to you and should, or should look suspect to you because mm -hmm. that's that that's that provider and that's that protector in you that uh, and they that you're protect, protecting the other female that's in the other females that's in your house the other other little one that's in your house it it, it changes it changes your mindset because um, you start being paranoid a little bit but no that it comes from love. Being paranoid as a father, as a first-time father of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a daughter, it comes from love. Because you ever you don't ever want to see anything happen that you couldn't to 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 be in a place that you to feel that you couldn't protect her is something that no man wants to feel or should have to feel. So, like I said, it's gonna it's gonna change your life. But know that being that paranoid, it comes from love. Um, I'll say uh, my role model, um, like I said, my biggest, I don't necessarily have a role model. Uh, like I said, my biggest influence were the females that were in my life. Um, but as a male, I see the importance of a role model. Uh, I see the importance of a role model. And I, I'll give you one example. Like I said, my father was, uh, wasn't very affectionate. Um, but that's one lesson that he taught me is because I wanted to change that. I wanted to be more affectionate to my children. I wanted to hug them. I wanted to kiss them. I wanted to tell them I love them every day, which I do, which I do. Um, so they don't have a, a void of love or a void of affection. So they're not going out seeking it. That was my mindset about it, is that if I gave it enough to them, they wouldn't have to seek it from somewhere else. And it's also transferable. One example, like I said, that I give, uh, that, I, that I talk about, is that my five-year-old, I'm, we, we're very affectionate, tells, he tells, you know, he loves me, I make him say that he loves me, um, one of the things that he does with his mother, that he sees me do, is that, that when he greets her, when he hugs her, he also, you know, he'll also do this on instinct, that he also goes, you know, grab her by her hand, and kiss her on her hand, or kiss on her shoulder, or kiss on her neck. Uh, those are some of the things that he's seen that he's seen me do. Mm -hmm. So, the, so 
his affection that he has, for the, 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 the reverence that he has for his mother, it came from me. So now, not only does he have that affection and that love for his mother, that it can be transferred to any other woman that's in his life. Yes. JT, would you like to chime in on either being a role model or your role model in your life? Being a role model is very important because um, you're talking about the impact that you can have on somebody's life. It's like a sponge, like what you pour into it, how you water it, how they soak it up. Is everything that you, you're pouring into it um, spiritually and, and, and naturally. And I think for myself, um, just thinking about, you know, congratulations, by the way. Um, y'all are going to be great parents, um, without question. Um, y'all are already great leaders in the community. So to think about you had the opportunity yeah. to pour into a child, another child, what a blessing. But I don't take those things lightly. Um, just to be able to have an impact on my kids. And, and that, that within itself is one of the greatest things that I can say outside of the things that, that I do that do, do not win in comparison to being that role model. That first time that, that your kids are looking at you, you realize that they're looking at every move, every move you make, everything you say. That within itself is one of the greatest things that you can feel as a parent, and especially as a father. But when you see them, them mold and become um, an entity of who you are, that within itself is like, it's a moment that the first time that I, I realized it, it doesn't speak to it. So definitely being a role model is definitely um, one of the most blessed experiences in his life. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Jonathan, um, I know that you are not a father yet, or at least that you know of, <laughs> <laughs> as you always say. Um, yeah. Tell us who has been a role model for you or, or how do you feel about being a role model to other um, boys and men in the community? Oh, yeah. Uh, first, I want to say congratulations, said, uh, you know, congratulations to both of y'all, you know, and, um, you know, and, 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 and you said, I know you're going to be a great father, you know, just being a great dude yourself and always helping people, what you do with the elderly and what you do in the community. I know you're just going to you know, pass it on to your daughter and, and, and make her a great, grow up to be a great woman, you know. Um, I, I want to say as far as role models, um, I have my father in my life. I have my grandfather, you know, my actually all of them passed away. My father's, my father's no longer here. My grandparents are no longer here. Uh, but I, I know I did have the, uh, the pleasure of having them in my life all throughout until, you know, I became an adult and stuff. Uh, and my father, he was my role model. Uh, he, he was he was in my life, taught me many things. I can't pinpoint any particular thing to put on this panel because he's, he's just taught me so many things. And one of the things I want to say, well, I do want to say this, is uh, my father, the things that my father did teach me, he didn't teach me with his mouth. He taught me with his actions. Uh, he did things that, that showed his character and showed that he had integrity. He didn't do a lot of talking. He did a lot of doing, you know, and um, so I just want to throw that out there. Uh, and I want to say, um, the other question was, uh, oh, me being a role model. Uh, uh, yeah, y'all don't follow me. <laughs> I, I got nothing growing up to do, <laughs> no, but, but, uh, yeah, I know I joke and say, I, you know, I don't, I don't have any kids that I know about, you know, you know, people got wild in their twenties, you know, when you're out there in the world, <laughs> but if I had, if I knew that I had some children though, I'd, I'd definitely take care of them. It wouldn't be no question about that. Even, you know, I know some people, <laughs> hey, if, if there's a possibility if a woman pops up and says, hey, I got little Jonathan Jr. way back, you don't, you know, and I, I'd step up. I just, I'd make, I'd be in that kid's life. I'll figure it out, you know? So, uh, yeah, I just salute to all the men on the panel that's just, you know, being good men and, and being good fathers, you know? Oh, I wanted to, um, to kind of piggyback off of something that uh, Dwayne had said, um, you know, going into the, with the daughter. So with my teenage daughter here now, so, you know, trying to get to, to prepare myself for this new journey and this role. Um, I know I get on her nerves and I get on Tiffany's nerves too, because, <laughs> you know, they were here before me. Right. And so, you know, Tiffany's doing what she feels is best for her daughter, you know, like, you know, same thing with her dad and stuff like that. But allowing me to 
have some input because I'm her husband, because I'm the man of the house and stuff like that has been a huge honor. So it's things that I think about, you know, I, I this is my daughter, right? But, you know, we get technical, you know, she's not really my daughter, but she's my daughter. And I'll correct somebody with the quickness. <laughs> but I look at her and I look at if that was my daughter, what would I say? What would I do? And so I know, like, so she, I be on her. Like, she'll, you know, walk around the house. I'm like, I'm not with that shirt. <laughs> and, you know, oh, but it's then and it's fashion. It's this now, whatever. No, you're not going nowhere with me with that shirt. You're going to change or you're not going to go. <laughs> and, and so I know, like I said, it, it'll kind of get on their nerves. But eventually we had that conversation where it's like, do you understand why I made you change your shirt? Do you understand why I told you you're not wearing that lipstick? You know what I mean? Like we, you know, we get into those conversations. And so this kind of goes into, and this was something that my mom taught me. And this was her trying to, trying to fulfill both parent roles, you know, and you used to kind of always hear that, you know, I do this because I love you. And that, I, it was like a double-edged sword back in the day. Cause you know, when I was getting the whoopings, it was like after the whoopings, you know, 15 minutes later, I'm in there, I'm sore. <laughs> and then my mom come to the door and it's like, you know, I did this because I love you. <laughs> and so then back then it was like, man, what kind of love is that, mama? But like now as a, a, a man, like some of that makes it, it was like a, a unspoken conversation, you know? And so it's like, it kind of made sense. It was like, now I know, I know what that was for. I know what that meant. I know the lesson, I, you know, and, and we, you know, we move forward from that. So it didn't take too many whoopings for me to get the picture. And then, you know, I was the one kid that wasn't getting them. But, you know, that 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 quote just is, it's kind of universal, you know what I mean? So it's like, you know, I do this because I love you. It means a lot. Um, and it stands for a lot. So, um, but I just wanted to kind of piggyback off of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving along, and unless anyone has anything else that they want to add to this part of the discussion on um, role models, uh, Ms. Kalima, would, would you like to add to anything before we move on? Yes, I'm sorry. I was trying to get off mute. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I did want to say, um, because, you know, the book is about the fatherless generation, that you know, having been a single mom for a period of time, that it's important uh, to, to do as much as you can to make sure that the child has contact with their father. But it's, and it's also important to make sure you surround him with other role models. Um, even before I met my husband, of course, I had my brother-in-law, Ali, who is my sister that was here with us, her husband, um, her, her older son, you know, my, my other brother-in-law, my brother, my father, my uncles, you know, you just have to keep those, that male energy around. Yes. Because you, you can, you know, all we know how to do is be a mother. We yeah. don't know, a bird can only fly. It doesn't do anything else. And we're mothers and we just be mothers. And um, we have to make sure we keep that male energy around, you know, even um, cousins and things like that. So we just want to make sure we create role models in their lives if they're not readily in the house. And so um, they can fly, they can do what they need to do, you know, in spite of the circumstances that they have with the decisions that we make as adults. Yes, I completely agree with that. And I mentioned that earlier as well. So that's, it was really important for me to have those positive role models around for um, both my, my daughter and my son, but even more for my son, because I knew that he needed that. Um, so yes, that was a very good point. Thank you for bringing that back to the forefront. Um, I wanted to say this, and this is in your book, which I'm sure you'll, you'll recognize it, Mr. Shafi. You said, if you know his father, don't worry about his son. Can you elaborate on that for me? Um, it's, I think it's, a, it's another powerful quote when it comes to the type of person you want your child to be. So if um, just listening to, to your husband, first thing I know he's going to be an amazing father because you picked him, you know, you picked him to, to be together and you wouldn't have picked a knucklehead. So, you know, I have, <laughs> have, uh, have confidence in him and, 
And from all I've heard about you, you're, you're a, a great young man and you'll be an amazing father. And that quote just reflects on the, the type of person that you are now that if somebody knows you, then they automatically know your child because they're going to have that same positive qualities that you uh, display yourself. So it's, I, it, it's, that I can't emphasize the point enough that, you know, our, as one of the, the, the individuals happened to uh, speak on a panel that said that, you know, our children, they, they listen to what we say sometimes, but they will imitate what we do. So actions are always more important than words. So the way you comport yourself, the way you lead your life is going to be a direct reflection on your child. So if people know you, then they already know that your daughter is going to be an outstanding young lady. Yes, thank you. Um, share one, th and I'm going to ask each um, person on the panel, share a quality as a man that you feel it's important to teach your boys or your sons. Uh, to me, I think the number one quality that you could teach a young man is hard work. There is nothing worse than a lazy man. Mm. So teaching your children, your son early, listen, men get things done and you got to work for it and you have to have that discipline and you have to have that will to succeed. But hard work is something that I see on a regular basis that our young men are missing. The women come in, the mothers, the girlfriends, the wives, females around them wound, wind up taking on their role for them and holding their hand. And the man, the young men, as they're growing up, do, they don't seem like they have the fortitude that we've had when we were growing up that, no, I'm embarrassed that if somebody has to do something for me that I can do for myself, especially a woman, it's supposed to be my job. So teaching hard work, I think, is monumental in raising a boy. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, Dwayne, what would, what's one quality that you would say needs to be taught to your sons or, your, or the, the men in your life, boys in your life? Sure. Um, I would say two, probably so, same quote, but probably say it different ways. Um, let your yeses be yes and your noes be no, or either your word is bond, um, meaning that don't waver on what you're, what you're asked to do, or don't waver on what you're promised to do or say you're going to do. Um, let your yeses be yes and your noes be no. Um, and if you're, if you tell someone that you're going to do something, then do it. Uh, I think that's, that's important when it comes to laying down a foundation. Um, that part, because a lot of men believe that. A lot of men, you know, still, you know, believe, you know, that we still do business with a, with a, with a answer and a handshake. Um, a, a lot of older gentlemen believe Believe that your word is your bond. That I can count on you because you said I can count on you. Mm -hmm. So to, to, to anybody that's out there that's listening, that would be the advice that I would have or, you know, the, the one that I would take in that, that sits in my mind. Um, because I want someone to believe that I am going to do what I said I'm going to do. Um, and it's, I'm not, but I, I wouldn't budge from that. Right, so. right. I like it. Very nice. Thank you for sharing that. Jonathan, what do you feel is a quality that um, as a man you should teach to other boys or other men in the community? Integrity. You know, always, always walk with integrity. Uh, <clears throat> just, just be honest with people. Don't uh, just recently in my own uh, personal life, you know, I had to tell a lot of my clients uh, I was kind of going through some things right there and I couldn't really, 
you know, deliver on the things that I said I could do for them. And instead of just keeping them in the dark, I just, hey, I got to be honest. I got to tell each one of these clients, they don't pay me their money. Let me sit down, talk to each one of them, tell them what I'm going through, what I'm going to do for them to rectify this and just walk with integrity. Don't don't keep anybody in the dark. Uh, you know, say what you say you're going to do. If something does come up, just be completely honest. Don't, if people, like I said, your word is all you have. If you, if you start breaking that reputation, your word start not being no good. Yeah, I don't know what to say. You, you start, you're not too good yourself if you can't walk with integrity. So just, just keep it real. Like they say, keep it real as, as, as much as you can. Yes, yes. Um, Cedric, what would you say would be a quality that you feel is essential for teaching boys or men in our community? Um, so I had one, and crazy thing is my mom taught me this. Um, and you know, me and my wife have had some conversations here lately the last couple of weeks, um, kind of in reference to our daughter, really. And um, so I feel like it's just it's it's universal. It works for you know your young you know young boys and your young girls. But like I said, my mom taught me this and, and, you know, excuse my forwardness for this, but it was, you don't eat or drink off the screw me side of the menu. Um, so <laughs> to be frank, you know, to put it out there, you know, you know, she used to tell me when she would go out, she'd go out to the bars, the clubs and stuff <laughs> like that, that she's not going unless she got at least $5 in her pocket <laughs> or she got the money to cover her drink and her food and get home. So, you know, yeah, you know, you go out and the guys are like, yeah, hey, can I buy you a drink this, that, third, or whatever, but you never know what those intentions are or whatever, so you need to make sure that you can cover your own, and I felt like that, her, her telling me that and teach me that, it just, it kind of went, she told, I have a, a middle sister, and I got an older brother, and I got um, some stepbrothers and stuff like that, but, you know, in my household, it was three, and I was the middle child, but she told all three of us that. So this went for my sister just as well as it went for me as well as it went for my brother. So it's like you going out with a bunch of your friends, y'all going to the mall. If you ain't got it, you don't need to go. You need to be able to take care of yourself because the last thing you need is somebody else doing it for you. And now you owe them. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and it's so many situations that you can apply that to. So, you know, we was talking about this before um, my wife went on the trip and uh, the vehicle caught a flat, right? You know, so she was like, babe, I need to learn how to change a tire. And I was like, I'm with you, me too, because my dad didn't show me that, you know? And so it's not a, a, a gender role thing because I, I, I don't like to stick to those. I, I'm a, a man and a husband in my house that don't mind cooking. I don't mind cleaning, folding clothes, doing laundry, mopping the floors, you know, stuff that people consider that that's what the wife and the mom is supposed to do. I don't mind getting up and doing that because I believe in teamwork, make the dream work. So, you know, if it's something that I need to learn, you know, so that way I don't have to depend on somebody, then yeah, I'm all for it. So, you know, we was talking about, I was like, yeah, like I said, and, and our daughter needs to learn too. I was like, now it's all good when she meets that man and luckily or you know, hopefully enough that he had that rearing from his father so that he would do it for her. But in the sake of that didn't happen, she can do it herself. So that's, that, that's huge for me. My, my dad told me that too. What? To not go out on a date or go out with a man, you can't pay your own tab. He, he taught me that too. And that was more of, as a girl coming from my dad is a uh, protection um, because he wanted to make sure that I didn't have to rely on that man or rely on who I was with um, because then it, it puts me in a vulnerable situation or puts me in a vulnerable state. So that's why I was laughing when you said that. My, my father, he pretty much said the same thing just in the yeah. Fred Brown way. Yeah. Yeah, my, my mom was a little more vulgar with yes, her. Yes, mine was, was too. It was that <laughs> F me menu or whatever. But you know, I'm just, just wanted to, you know, for the viewers out there, I didn't want to, you know. Nice, nice. JT, what would you say is a quality that um, you uh, have taught your sons or you feel is important to teach the boys and the men in our community? Biggest thing is respect. 
foundation of everything. You're able to show respect and also have respect about yourself. And understanding that's going to set the tone for everything that you do in this life, whether it's a job interview, whether it's, you, you know, I'm going somewhere, it's going to stand out because that's a rare quality. People seem to forget about that thing about showing respect and also getting the respect. Um, because it's so rare in these day and days and time, it's going to stand out when you do it and you exhibit it. And, and, and it's going to also be one of those things that, that people are going to say, okay, you know what, that's a respectable young man. He knows how to carry himself. Um, he, he, he was taught right. Um, that was something that was embedded in me in a young age. And, and I still believe in that. And so those, that's one of the first things that, um, I would say, um, is, is a, is a baseline for being the type of, of young man or young lady that you want to be, have some self-respect about yourself. We got to go out here doing all that cussing and, and, and thinking that you cool, you know, in your, in your, in, you know, when you ain't around your parents, because you still, or exhibiting what you're being taught, just to you out here and be like, okay, I'm getting away with it. I'm saying this, I'm saying that. Nah, you ain't got to do that. Show some respect about yourself. Don't just be like you, you know, you fitting in, stand out and be that individual, stand strong. And you'll, you'll get further in this life, being able to stand on your own two feet and know that there's some respect and you're able to show it as well. Yes. Um, I wanted to talk just very briefly, because we're talking about um, men and the, being father, fatherless and, the, you know, as far as families are concerned, but I would like just briefly to talk about the, the effect that having an absent father affects you as a husband. Does, can anybody comment on that? I can. Um, and it's, it's not, it's not from my experience. Um, I like I said, one of <laughs> one of my uh, things that I talk about whenever I come on is that I've been married four times. <laughs> I've had stepchildren and stepchildren in all the marriages, um, except for the ones that I've had children in. Well, uh, well, except for the the ones that I have had children in and uh, the one that I have now, because um, my current wife now we have uh, five kids total, and three are. Uh, I have two stepdaughters um, and we have uh, one son together. Um, what I've learned is that, you know, from an absentee father is that you, you, you lose a lot. You lose a lot on how, number one, you lose a lot on how to treat women because an absentee father doesn't tell you how to treat a woman. It doesn't tell you how to, to, to act a certain way around a woman. Um, one of the things that you, you lose when you have an absentee father is that you lose, like I said, you lose accountability. Um, being a man is hard. It is a hard, it is a hard life. Um, and being, a, and I'm gonna say this too, being a black man is even harder. Um, because there are some things that we go through that's different than our counterparts, being white males or our female counterparts. There are a lot of things that, that are just different that you can only get from another man. Like the conversations that we have, this, the experience that we have, um, the day-to-day -day things that we go through is different. Um, so you can only get those from another man that's been through that kind of, that's been through that fire, that's been through that every day. So you lose, you lose part, you lose that, or you, you never have that when you don't have a father that's in your life, that's someone that's absent. And then one of the things that we talked about is, as, as a, I want to go back to is, as a role model, is that you want to have the right kind of role model. Mm -hmm. Because... If you don't, uh, a male child will find a role model. And as a child, you don't pick the best role models because you don't know what to look for. Mm -hmm. So you look for the closest. You might look for something that's convenient or you might look for something that stands out, something that's flashy, something that's easy. Right. So whenever, whenever, whenever we are trying to get males involved in, uh, young male's life, we want to make sure that we have the right kind of role models um, in their lives. Um, I can tell you right now that 
some of my uh, past relationships, they had the wrong kind of role models. Um, and their sons lean toward those role models that they had in their lives. So um, by being an absentee father, by being a, an absent father, you, you lose a lot. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you for bringing that out. Thank you very much. I want to the second on that um, because for me, you know, growing up, I didn't have that role model either. And those role models are very influential on your life and the things that you do, especially when you don't have it for that young part and kind of coming up. So, um, you know, my mom, she dated guys after, you know, my dad and, um, you know, she wouldn't bring them around unless, you know, it was like a real serious thing. And so I, would look for my father in them, right? Um, so uh, there was one guy that she dated for like seven years. And, you know, for the longest time, I would be sitting in the room and he'd be sitting in the room. We wouldn't say two words to each other. But it was kind of like we kind of understood each other. And then eventually I started doing things that he did. Like I, I, I kind of picked up on my style of dress from him. I mean, he used to you know, dress real fly, real sharp, real respectable, you know, and um, I just kind of picked up on that from him, and I looked at it because I didn't have anybody else to look, you know what I'm saying, for that too. You know, my older brother, you know, like I said, my dad wasn't there, so, you know, he ended up getting into a life of trouble, you know, and I, you know, remember reading about some of that in the book, you know, there was different um, families, different situations, you know, or, you know, you see how things went differently, you know, my brother got into a life of trouble, a life of uh, the gang life, you know, prison a couple times, this and that, and it's like, we didn't have that father to look to, to kind of steer us in a better direction, so, um, and then for me, um, some of the guys that my mom dated were married, um, and so like I said, now, our parents are not perfect, nobody's perfect here, but I didn't realize how much that had an effect on me too, because that's all I knew coming up. And so it wasn't necessarily right. And these, and, and they were, they were good dudes. Right? I'm not gonna lie. You know, I learned a lot from these guys, but you know, you can't ignore or close your eyes to the fact that these are married men. And so I'm, I'm looking at that and growing up with that, like that's the normal you know, and, and it's not. And like I say, I, I learned a lot of this stuff on the fly. Um, so I didn't have that that role model to to show me what a husband is really supposed to be. So I made a lot of mistakes early, and, and having to try to learn from them, you know, in the, in, in in the cycle of actually going through it, has been very rough for me because. I don't know what I'm doing, you know, and I, and I didn't have that person to show me what I need to do. I didn't have that, you know, those family, those households where it's like, oh, yeah, you know, mom and pops, you know, we celebrating 50 year anniversary, blah, 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 you know what I mean? And, and it's a difference in how those guys, you know, came up, you know, having that. And I didn't have that, you know, so I, I don't, I'm, I'm looking at all kind of other things, you know, whether it's social media, whether it's you know, famous people and stuff like that to, to try to figure out what I'm supposed to do as a husband. And honestly, it took Tiffany to show and teach me how to be her husband. So not just a husband, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out, but she's, she's been, you know, teaching me how to be her husband. So I, I think that's, big for my life. I, I know one thing that, that I was able to, uh, to see in the interviews that I had with um, um, young men who, were, who grew up with absent fathers, the, the biggest thing that they were missing in their lives was balance. Um, they, they had no equilibrium. Um, they, most of them had amazing mothers and it wasn't for their mothers they would not be the men that they are today, but they still missed the father. And they only had that, that one side um, that they could 
um, relate to and have as an example. And one thing that I have in the book, I didn't get this interview myself. I didn't solicit the interview, but I, I was able to to find the interview. It was an interview with Kevin Durant. And Kevin Durant was raised by an amazing mother, but a father who was absentee the majority of his life. And um, he had that hole in his heart and he was able to heal that, that hole with his father. His father actually uh, wrote a letter to him. And in the letter, he told his son um, all of the things that he didn't do for him. And he asked for his son's forgiveness and asked for his son, begged for his son to allow him to come back in his life. And even with bitterness, even with pain, even with a mother who raised him the majority of his life, he was a little skeptical because he had become famous and he didn't know if this is a guy who just, you know, because I'm famous now, he wants a piece. But um, he accepted his apology and they were able to form a relationship. And it wasn't, once again, that forgiveness, it, it wasn't about uh, forgiving his father, but it was about allowing himself to to feel forgiveness. And uh, he's a better man for it. But balance to me is the the most important thing. Once you have the you know that male and that female energy in you, and you know the difference between the two, you would be surprised how you can navigate your life a lot smoother. That's a very good point. Thank you for sharing that. I want to touch real briefly on what um, Dwayne said. Um, about Black fathers. In your book, you, it looks like you quoted Jay Henson Sr., where it says, young Black men have to be raised with a little more structure. There has to be a little more discipline, just in the matter of what they expect, because a lot of times we have to work twice as hard to levy up to our counterparts. I want to touch real briefly on that, because I think it's it, very important to, because there's all Black men on this panel, right. and not saying that, um, other my uh, other races don't have the same effects, but I think it's important that since we do have an all African American um, panel tonight, that it's important to touch on that briefly. So, Shafiq, can you um, touch on that, please? Sure. Um, so, I think one thing that we have to do as fathers is, especially if we have sons, our sons have to level up. We have to be able to tell them point blank, being a black man is not going to be easy. You have to have integrity. You have to have uh, a will to succeed, but you also have to realize that if things are going to be more difficult for you, you take that as a challenge to be the best person that you can be. You don't look at it as a burden. You look at it as an obligation because to be the best that you can be it is incumbent upon fathers to make sure that we let our children know that um, this life is not easy and, and maybe it wasn't meant to be easy, but you tend to find individuals who had to live a more difficult life, but look at it in a positive light that you know what, whatever didn't kill me only made me stronger. And we have to, we have to teach our kids that, that it's a, uh, it's important. These streets are, they're not playing, you know, and it's people out there who could care less about your feelings. They don't, they don't want a, a black man out there crying when I tell you to do something, you got to do it. And so we have to teach our kids to be strong because it, it's literally a matter of life and death. And anybody else like to comment on that before we move on to one more thing? Um, I do. Um, so we just kind of went through that with our with our son with Devin. Um, you know, he likes to take his BB gun outside and try to shoot squirrels and stuff. And um, you know, when he's with his dad, they kind of live out in the country, and, and that's probably fine and Danny out there. But we live in a neighborhood here, and he wasn't understanding why I told him that he could not go outside with that BB gun and just be out there openly shooting squirrels. You know, and so me and Tiffany both had to kind of sit down with him like, do you understand that from a distance, that looked like real good. Mm -hmm. And if the cop car come rolling around the corner and they see you with that, they might not ask no questions. Right. 
they might go ahead and let you down. And and then next thing you know, we don't have a son. Right. I mean, you understand that we're not trying to let that happen. So I'm I'm not trying to kill your joy and your fun, but and being a black boy outside with a BB gun. <laughs> right. And someone see you. Yep. But and I mean, and then the number two, um, I kind of wanted to, I didn't know if. I don't know if this kind of is, is relatable or not. Um, I know it's a big topic too. I've been trying to teach my son about colorism. And I say this because people are generalized that, oh, you know, black man, strong black man is just dark skin, strong black man. My son is light skin with brownish red hair and freckles. Okay. My trying to get him to understand is that does not make you less of a black man. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that that's another topic that definitely needs to be highlighted because there's a lot of the black on black and the light skin versus dark skin. And, you know, we think that, it, you know, it's not really like that anymore, but it, it, it's still there, you know, and I hear it in him whenever he has conversations with some of his buddies and stuff in school, you know, and it's like, well, just because you got this guy over here, Gerard, and, and he's dark skin or whatever, that means he's going to be better at basketball than you. You know, yeah. he's still a black man. He's still your brother, you know, and trying to get him to understand that that's not how we, we look at things. Whatever you are still a black man, you know, you're still a black man. So. Yeah, that's another show. I, I got you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Indeed. I got. Um, a, I got a question yeah. I want to ask, uh, Shafi, um, and it's 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 uh, relatable. Now, we, before we got on the po- podcast, we were talking about you know some of our backgrounds. Like I said, my wife she actually grew up in uh, Philadelphia Southwest. Uh, she grew up on uh, um, Ogden Street. Um, so, and she said that before she came down here because she moved from. Um, Philadelphia to South Carolina and then we moved to North Carolina she mm-hmm. said she couldn't raise a son she said she didn't want to raise her children there and she said she definitely couldn't raise a son in Philadelphia um, so how important does an environment play into the fact that uh, raising the child or raising a son excuse me Good um, I, yeah I, I think it's tremendously important uh, with my my daughters when um, I lived the majority of my my early life in Philly and it was so The streets were so dangerous, even in nice neighborhoods that we lived in. By the time my my two youngest daughters were three years old, we we packed up the car and we uh we moved to uh Chesapeake, Virginia. We we got out of Philly and we we never went back. Um it environment is important. You can be the greatest parent in the world, but there are environmental influences that affect our children just like they affect us. So, you know, we always have to be careful of not just who our kids are around, but the environment that they are raised in because that is going to be a part of who they are. You could be the greatest parent in the world, but you can't negate the streets. You can, you can give lessons to your children, But if you have the opportunity to raise them in a more um, nurturing and healthy environment, that is the best thing for our children, especially for African-Americans, because we're going through enough trauma that we don't need to add on to it. Right. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I want it because we're running out of time. I wanted to make sure that I... Um, that we talked briefly about the goals. So in, looks like it's chapter five, Know Thy Father, you listed some goals. And it says, if we can focus on the following goals, much progress can be made toward molding boys into strong and productive men. So I just wanted, there's six of them. I just wanted to read through them. And if you want to, if anyone wants to comment on them or elaborate on them, then um, please feel free. So the first one is fathers must make their sons their priority. There may be extenuating circumstances that makes this difficult, but that cannot be the excuse. Um, I I think that's extremely important because um, there's nothing more important to any of us than to have life outside of ourself and our children. They are an extension of us. So no matter what, 
the father may be going with going through with the mother, no matter what the father may be going through economically, no matter what the father may be going through in their own life, their children have to be their priority. And that means, and this is about, about being a man, that means you got to make sacrifices and be okay with those sacrifices because at the end of the day, your children will benefit from what you gave them. Yes, yes. The second goal was fathers must think long and hard about the lifelong emotional damage they are inflicting on their child. Would if anybody you, like to comment on that one? I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I'll wait, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yes, go ahead. I do. Um, okay, go ahead, <laughs> um, because you, like I said, there's no, there's no God. There's no, there's no God to being a father. Um, every thing, every step that you take, every decision that you make, not just impacts you. Um, it impacts your children. Um, like I said, and then that too goes with whoever you choose as a mate. That means having children with that person. So, whenever we are just to just to talk about that part of it, just whenever we are thinking about having, picking a mate, just think about who that person is. Um, some, of, some of the panels that we talked about, we talk about generational curses. So we have to think about certain things like that, generational curses that can affect your child later on, some generational curses that you don't even know about as far as who your mate is. So those decisions you shouldn't take lightly. Um, because you're not just, you're not just thinking about you. You're thinking about whenever you marry somebody, I, I got into dating as possibly meeting someone and marrying someone and having children. with. Them. So that thought process was in me because I wanted to know who I was going to have children with and what kind of person I was going to marry. So to everybody that's out there that's listening on this end, just think about that part. It's not just affecting you. We're not, we don't want to be selfish as parents or as individuals in a, in a relationship. So you should think about, you know, that part of it. Have, have some uh, um, sight into the future um, and think about, you know, just the decisions that you're going to make, you know, as a parent or whenever you get into a relationship. I'm sorry. I was muted. I'm sorry. Um, the third goal is fathers must strongly consider the type of boys they are sending out into society. Has your child been given the proper tools to negotiate his way through life? Um, Ms. Kalima, I'm going to I'm going to bring you in on this one because you're a mom. Um, fathers must strongly consider the type of boys they are sending out into society. And has your child been given the proper tools to negotiate his way through life? I thought that was a really interesting question as a, as a mom when I'm thinking about my son. How about you? I definitely think um, we have to, you know, have some foresight in the tools, the toolbox that we give our children. And we want to go back to looking at our mentors in our own lives, you know, who, who do we, when we look around and see those people who have children and families that you want to model yourself after, we can have mentors at any age. We need mentors at work, at home, in our relationships, and so on. So I think um, the most important things that I hope and pray that I have put in my son's toolbox is um, faith and belief in God. Because if you don't believe that there is a higher power that you have to answer to, whether you're Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, doesn't make a difference what religion you choose. It's just guardrails in life. But if you don't feel that you have a higher power to answer to, then you don't have any motivation for true lasting change. Yeah. And so I, um, I feel like having that belief um, and, you know, trying to instill the love of education, of course, when they're teenagers, they don't like it. They don't love it. They don't want it. They want to play video games. But to instill in them a love of education and the, a bit, and the knowledge of their family history, I think is also important. It's just so many things we want to cram into that toolbox and really what is a short amount of time 
18, 20, 25 years. It's really not a lot of time to put all of those things in there. But, um, and I did want to say when you were talking about the, the some of the important things to teach them, and I agree with everything that everyone said, but I thought that we would want to add compassion and empathy for others. Because when you look at who was in the White House last, you know, that sort of behavior comes from people who lack compassion and empathy. And that's definitely something that we want to instill in our boys and our girls. But um, I hope I answered your question. I know I kind of yes. veered off into several yes, different did. places. <laughs> but um, definitely, I think in that toolbox, we want to have faith. We want to have perseverance. We want to teach them, you know, never, you know, never to give up and to make sure that they are protecting themselves and the people around them. You know, we just want to make sure we instill those things in them and put it in their toolbox of life. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Can I, can I add to what Clemo was saying? Um, with the toolbox, I definitely feel like it's important to have both pieces, pieces from the father and pieces from the mother, because we give different things that the kids need from the both of us. Um, and Tiffany can attest to this. When we talk about our son, you know, we bring up the the to be able to be vulnerable. Um, and this has kind of been an argument with, with his father. Um, and this is kind of, you know, you're not gonna agree on everything, but we just feel like it's an important piece that he, he needs to have. And it's it, to be able to cry if you need to. Um, and I, you know, like I said, I know everybody's not gonna agree on this particular topic because, you know, there's always the, well, men ain't supposed to cry type of thing, but um, I, don't know, I, just, I don't agree necessarily with that. I feel like, you know, to be able to cry, to be able to be sensitive, to be in touch with your feelings, to be able to talk about your feelings um, so that if you, you need something, you can get it. Um, and I feel like, and like I said, Tiffany can add to this, but I feel like that's what we've been trying to teach our, well, I know both our kids, but our son in particular, because, you know, and I'm hoping that because, you know, his father's in a different household and he's teaching them otherwise that he can decipher pieces and, and, and take the best of both worlds and use that to become his own man. Um, but that's just been a big thing, especially on our end. We feel like that's important for young men coming up to be able to express themselves and communicate. Yes, yes. Um, let's move on to the next goal because I wanna make sure we get them all in before we end for the evening. The fourth one is fathers, your sons will grow up to be copies of you. Be the role model that represents the best of you. JT, can you give us some, some feedback on that one? It was definitely the truth. I mean, like I said, they mirror what they see and um, the fathers and it's definitely one of those things that um, I've seen for myself. I mean, and and that really kind of happens when, it, as they get older, you see more and more of what you poured into them. You see more of that impact, and and I think that holds true for um, a lot of our situations. We see that whether um, we were uh, whether we existed in there or not, you see either or, and you understand how important that is, especially when you recognize how much of an influence you had on your child and your son and or daughter in particular. Yes, yeah, thank you. The fifth goal, um, fathers, your sons will one day be husbands and fathers themselves. Teach them well. Shafiq, I'm gonna let you comment on this one. Um, yeah, we. I, I think it's always important to to realize what we're what we are producing and what is going to go out into the world as our legacy. I don't think we've mentioned too much about legacies, but um, in the African American community, especially, it's is really important that that we we teach our children as we role model that they are going to be the legacy of this family, and that means we want to produce good husbands, good fathers, good citizens. And that all starts with us. And you know, your husband was was absolutely right that when you think about that toolbox, you wanna put what the male has, what the female has, and then you have some happy medium 
but it's important to to make sure we're doing everything to to send the best possible human being out into society because they are us. Yes, yes, thank you so much. And the last one, and you just touched on it, is six. Fathers, you must teach your sons that life for African-American male come with special challenges. Make them aware of how they have to conduct themselves around police and in society to stay alive. Um, Mr. Duane, I would love for you to, to speak on that because you've spoken on it before. Um, and I think this is a good one for you. And Jonathan, I have a special one for you. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Duane. Yes. So when we... That one is really important because we are, as as a as a black uh, male, we are judged just by um, past. Uh, we're judged by other blacks' past. We're judged by how people view us, how stereotypes view us. We're we're judged on how social media um, views us, and so it's important that we teach. You know other men how to conduct ourselves in, in public and around other people. So there's not that pre preconceived notion of who we are. Um, a lot of things can be changed uh, by just having manners. You can change a lot of minds by just saying yes ma'am and no ma'am. Um, you can change a, just a lot of minds by not, by being the total opposite of what everybody else sees on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, um, what you see in, you know, commercials or, or TV shows. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it's real important for us because every day we walk out the door, it, it feel, I don't, I don't want to say that, but in this com in this climate, it is, it is important to say that because every day that you walk out that door, it could be your last. That's true. That's very true. Very true. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for being on the panel tonight. And I want to close out. You had a list of songs in your book. And we chose one. So, Jonathan, we're going to play this song. It's by Will Smith. And it is Just the Two of Us. And 